Welcome back to another episode of Inside Number 23, my channel which is all about knitting and sewing and generally living the craftiest life possible. My name is Katie, you can find me pretty much everywhere on social media as Miss Lavelli, and I'm coming to you as always from Hertfordshire which is just north of London in the UK where I live with my husband Emrys and our lovely pug puppy Rolly and it is about as dark and as grey and as overcast <laughs> as it is possible to be at this point point um I'm uh, I'm not entirely sure what's been going on with our weather recently it's been a little bit a little bit nuts but um but yeah it's not great so again this is going to be another week that I start with apologies about the lighting because it's not great but we're going to crack on and and see how we get on with things how are you guys? I am so excited to be back with you again. Thank you so much for coming to spend a bit of time with me and welcome back if you're a long-term viewer. It's lovely to see you again and hello and welcome if this is your first time checking out the podcast. I so appreciate you um, taking a little bit of time to spend it with me today and talk about some crafty bits and pieces. It's been another hectic week inside number 23 this week and in particular it feels a little bit squished because not a full week has gone by since my last episode as I recorded that at the weekend so it doesn't really feel like a huge amount of time has gone by since I spoke to you last which is which is kind of nice because it feels like we're having a regular conversation but it also means that I don't have a huge amount of new stuff to share with you for this episode. I do have lots of bits and pieces to talk about but I have an inkling that it might be a slightly shorter episode this week so there we go. To get us kind of kick-started, I do have the absolute joy and privilege of announcing a prize winner this week. Yay! So exciting. Um, we do have a Ravelry group for the podcast, which you can find by searching inside number 23 on the groups tab on Ravelry. That will bring you to our group, um, which is where you can get involved with things like giveaways and knit-alongs and all of that lovely stuff. And from uh, two weeks ago, I have a lovely giveaway which was hosted by Black Yarns. Um, the amazing people of Black Yarns sent us a really lovely package which was just stuffed full of their newest line which is of course brushwork. Um, I had a giveaway thread open in the Ravelry group for the last two weeks and thank you so much to everybody who entered. I think we had close to 650 entries or something like that which is just insane so thank you. Um, and I have the pleasure of having the winner, which I drew at random, random number generator brought up the number of this post, which was post number eight, which excitingly was Little Bush Baby, who is Aileen. And Aileen I actually met um, at Edinburgh Yarn Festival this year, and she is an absolutely wonderful, beautiful human being. So I'm utterly thrilled that this prize is going to her so congratulations um drop me an email and i will get that sent off to you as soon as possible and yay i'm so happy for you aileen just oh i love it i love sending out prizes um particularly when they're going to absolutely gorgeous wonderful people like yourself um talking about emails i have been remiss and not mentioned mine my email for the podcast is katie at inside number 23.com um so please drop me an email if you have any questions or queries regarding anything to do with the podcast when it comes to communication about the podcast um i do solely answer um things that come through the email so if you do want to get in touch for any reason just drop me a line there and I'll get in touch as soon as I can. Okay let's kick off proceedings as we always do with what am I wearing and this week I'm pretty thrilled to say that my entire outfit is actually me made. Um, it's been a little bit of a rare occurrence recently because I've been very very tired, I've been working hard and I've been just kind of wearing a lot of shop bought things because it's easier to just pull those on. A lot of my me made garments are slightly more kind of put together I guess you would say. So they're not the type of thing that I usually slob around in <laughs> which is a good thing I suppose but I am in the process of making some more um, kind of relaxed clothes. Um, out of my me made bits and pieces rather than things that feel a little bit more formal. Not that this is a formal outfit, but you know what I mean. It's not a tracksuit bottom and a stretchy top, is it? So <laughs> 
But um, let's actually talk about what I am wearing. Um, underneath is the blouse version of the Robe Blue A dress that I made out of this gorgeous cotton and steel fabric. I picked up this fabric at Brooklyn General Store while we were there in um, January and I made this blouse pretty soon after that and I really really love it. It's, um, it's just a lovely thing to wear. And it's exactly the same as the um, Blue A dress which is a deer and doe pattern. Um, if I hadn't said that already, completely lost track of whether I'd mentioned that, but it's exactly the same, just cut off at kind of just above the hip to turn it into a blouse. I've also paired it with my Sophie cardigan, this gorgeous cardigan, uh, which I knit up for my birthday last year. So it was completed September last year. Um, it's knit out of John Arban, their Viola yarn in the Aquarius colorway, which is DK weight. I really, really love this cardigan. Um, it has beautiful kind of cabling detail on it. Um, it's a little kind of cropped cardigan. It's very, very sweet. One thing I would say about this yarn, it has pilled a lot um, since I knit this up. Um, I'm constantly getting the gleaner onto it and de-pilling it, but it just pills like nobody's business. I think that that's the kind of risk you take when you're knitting something out of what is 100% merino. It does tend to pill a little bit, but it doesn't stop me loving it and um, just really enjoying wearing it. Also, on my lower half um, that you can't see, I am actually wearing my denim version uh, of the Hollyburn skirt, which I love. It's a skirt with pockets and it's comfy and gorgeous and it makes me happy. So yeah, that is what I'm wearing this week. I'm going to jump straight in to what's on my needles this week. This is definitely, I think, going to be the most hefty of our segments. Um, I do have some fun things to share, although it doesn't look like a huge amount of progress has been made on some of these items, but believe me, there has, but I'll get more into that a little bit later. But first of all, I'm happy to say that I completed um, the frogging back of my Hufflepuff Pride cardigan. Last week I talked about how I'm being really, really strict with myself regarding a lot of projects, um, ripping things back, um, de-stashing some yarn, shopping from the yarn that I have, so basically casting on projects that I have yarn for rather than craving new yarn, which has been a really, really positive experience thus far. I've really, really enjoyed it. And I'm also thrilled at the amount of you who are very much on the same page as me um, regarding stash and how you see it as a very positive thing in your own lives and that's been very inspirational so thank you for everybody who kind of um, commented around that last week that was amazing but I have oh, just reaching out of frame to grab this to show you um completely washed and dried my nitpicks yarn um from the Hufflepuff Pride cardigan. It's a little bit crinkly still in um, in areas but mostly it's all washed and ready to go, ready to be re-balled up and knit into something wonderful. Um, I have had a couple of questions about um, my process of kind of frogging something back so very briefly um, you'll remember from last week what I had done is just completely ripped out all of the cardigan um, and rolled the yarn into rough little balls as I had gone. What I then do um, for those of you who don't have experience in ripping things back and what you do with yarn, my process is I will then use my yarn swift to take that little ball and um, wrap the yarn into an open skein. So obviously if I were to twist this up, it would look like a normal kind of skein of yarn that you would just buy like from an indie dyer or something like that. So this is just an open skein. I then once all of the balls were skeined up like this, the yarn was super, super crinkly. So it looked like kind of ragdoll curls, um, all crinkles um, and and kinky yarn. It was, it was very unappealing. It's not the type of yarn that I would want to knit straight back into a project, particularly because I was dealing with a lot of yarn that was in that condition. I then run a little bath for my yarn um, and I give it a little soak, a very quick soak with a little bit. I do put a little bit of... Um, like sock soap or yarn soap or whatever I've been using to kind of wash my woolens with just because I like the smell of it and I also think it's it's really nice and and um, softens everything and it's it's just it's more for me I guess than the yarn because all I'm wanting to do is kind of reset it um get it all wet um 
get rid of the excess water, so get it all out of the bath. Um, I tend to wrap it in a towel and squeeze out the excess and then kind of squeeze through the skein as well. Um, and then I hang them all up. So I'll hang them up just like this so that the weight of the yarn can kind of stretch out um, the, the kinks and everything falls out. Um, I know some people do put a little weight in the bottom to kind of stretch it. Um, I sometimes will hang a hanger on the bottom actually because I find that it's just a little bit amount of, of weight um, to straighten up the yarn without putting too much on it. Um, and then yeah, once it's dried it's ready to be balled up again. So that's all ready to be knit into another project. I understand that that was probably very boring for people who do this on a regular basis, but um, I never like to assume that everybody knows everything. So that is how I do it for everybody who was interested previously. Let's talk about something a little bit more positive and actually kind of something that I have created rather than something that I am in the process of uncreating. <laughs> because wouldn't that just be the most bizarre knitting project if every week I turned up with projects that were almost finished and went, no, I'm not interested, I'm just going to undo all the work that I've done. That would be a little bit bizarre. <laughs> um, but I have very happily... Um, kind of completed. It's not finished, 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 finished because it hasn't been blocked and the ends haven't been woven in but I'm so excited about it. I'm so happy with it and it is going to be finished, 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 finished this evening because I intend to sew these these um, ends in and get it blocked as soon as I've finished editing this episode and that is my colour field short. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. It's amazing, it's amazing. <laughs> it really is amazing. I love this so much and it's taken so little time. It, I, I think everybody should knit at least two of these. This is my second. This is the Colourfield Shawl by the incredibly talented Kemper Ray, whom I adore, who is the creator of Junk Yarn, the yarn brand and also Junk Yarn podcast. And oh my goodness, this project makes me so happy. This is a DK weight shawl, which I have knitted up with two skeins of glorious Libyana Me yarn, which I picked up at Edinburgh Yarn Festival last year. And I absolutely love it. If you'll see, it is a combination of um, alternating stockinette stitch with kind of slip stitch detailed stripes and then at the bottom along the border it has the most incredible squidgy stretchy border along there which is also done with slip stitches. It's one of my favourite finishes on a shawl ever. Um, in fact, I'm quite tempted to um, maybe mix it up with a sweater at some point and put this kind of detailing maybe around the, um, the hem or the sleeves. It's just beautiful. It's finished with an Icelandic bind off. And I remember when I knit this shawl the first time, when I knit it for my mum, um, that I thought that the Icelandic bind off was amazing and really fun. It kind of gives this um, almost I-cord bind off finish, but obviously it's, it's kind of like a garter stitch version of an I-cord bind off. Super, super quick. Um, usually bind offs take me forever. This took me pretty much no time at all and the shawl was done and I love it oh I can't wait to wear it I'm gonna you can see I've got a lot of ends I've got a lot of flyaway tails going so it definitely needs a little bit of TLC before it's going to be finished but I want to pop it on so I can show you how amazing it's going to be oh seriously Oh, it's so snuggly and warm and I will most likely wear it bandana style. That's usually how I wear the majority of my shawls and oh, I love it. I love it so much. It's just marvellous and I couldn't be happier with how it turned out. I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with shawl knitting because I really, really enjoy the process of, um, of shawl knitting but... I have found, sadly, that there aren't that many of the shawls that I've completed that I'll wear on a regular basis. I wear my void shawl all the time. I love my void shawl. Um, but 
a lot of my fingering weight shawls don't get a lot of um, outings. They'll get an outing every so often, but they're not the type of thing that I will reach to and gravitate towards. This shawl I know is going to be is going to be up there with the void shawl. It's going to be constantly being worn, particularly because of the colours. I just love it, and I'm so happy with it. It makes me happy on multiple levels. And yeah. DK White Yarn is just the best. This flew off the needles. Can't wait to have it completely finished, 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 finished and be able to wear it all the time. Ooh. So the other project that I have been spending a lot of time with over the past couple of days since I spoke to you last is my Neverton cardigan. Now the Neverton cardigan is a pattern from the reprinting of issue one of Pom Pom Quarterly. It's by Lydia Gluck. And you may recall that last time I spoke to you, I had made a fair bit of progress on the cardigan. I had knit all the way to where the armholes divide, where you start just working on the body backwards and forwards, and I was on a roll. I was pretty sure that I was going to be finished pretty quickly because it is a DK weight cardigan and I was, I was very confident that it was going to be finished soon. Like I said, I had knit kind of a little bit beyond the armhole and um, I was uh, the, the finishing line was definitely in sight. Where am I on this cardigan now? I'm just a little bit beyond the armhole. <laughs> and you may or may not think why are you just a little bit beyond the armhole if that's where you were when we spoke to you last time Katie and I can answer you that question. After recording I started to um, work out how many more decreases that I needed to do around the neckline because it's a relatively open fronted cardigan and um, you need to increase, I might have said decreases, I meant increases, <laughs> you have to increase your, your stitch count even when you are just doing the backwards and forwards, you know, beyond the shaping of the armholes. And I realised that I was a little bit off and I thought that's odd because I've only got one more set of increases to do. And I counted up the stitches and for some reason I was missing about 10 stitches, which is obviously five different repeats of increases because you increase in pairs on each side of the, the neckline. And I thought, how have I missed five increases? I've been recording all of this on my phone. I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. There's no way that I could have missed that amount of increases because it wasn't, you know, increasing every other row. It was maybe increasing after a several amounts of rows. So that would, you know, altogether, that would be a lot of knitting. That would be inches and inches of knitting that I had just not done and I thought I know that I've added this up correctly and something must be wrong with the pattern I go back to my notes guess who had misread their own instructions so I had written out exactly how many decreases that I needed to do on my phone and I'd just done something completely different and it was all documented on there so the only person to blame is myself because apparently I can't read and I can't even follow my own instructions that I've written out on my phone very clearly and then when I was noting the amount of repeats that I'd done it's a completely different number. Incidentally what that meant was um, I had stopped doing repeats when the repeats were much wider apart I won't go into the specifics because I don't want to give out numbers because obviously it's a paid for pattern. But the first batch of increases, I'm sure I've been saying decreases again. Oh, I'm confusing myself now. Basically, the first batch of increases that you do are done quite wide apart. Then you do a second batches of increases that are all much closer together. I had stopped doing the increases when they were supposed to be still quite wide apart and jumped straight doing the ones that were closer together, which meant that instead of having this nice smooth edge along the neck band as the pattern shows, mine kind of went smooth and then suddenly started doing this. <laughs> and I was just really annoyed to start off with, number one, very, very annoyed. But I knew that I wouldn't be able to live with this cardigan and wear it and enjoy it if it didn't look right. So I had to rip it back, way, way back, to where the wide increases were still happening, 
which was before you divided for the armholes and cast on additional stitches for the body. So I had to rip it back from basically where it is here, let's bear that in mind, this is pretty much where I was, to about here. So yeah, I lost all of this knitting. So the work that I've been doing on this over the past several days, a lot of work, is literally just redoing all of the work that I had done before because of my own silly, silly mistake. So in the, worlds of, in the words of the Knit More Girls podcast, which is incidentally an incredible audio podcast if you don't listen to it already, it was very much a knitting attacks moment and it took every ounce of my um, kind of self-control to not throw this at the wall and curse it into oblivion. But luckily, it's such a lovely project to knit on. I still really enjoyed knitting it the second time. Um, so that's partly to do with the pattern. I do really, really enjoy the pattern and the details. I love the little, um, the little neck band, how it's all kind of textured. I think that's a lovely touch. Um, and it's also very intuitive when you actually do what you're supposed to do and don't make up the pattern yourself. It's also to do with the fact that the yarn is just beautiful. This yarn is um, by The Wool Kitchen. It's the Champagne Supernova colorway on her DK weight yarn, which is 100% BFL. And I just love all of these little smatterings of neon. I think that they are so stunning. I absolutely love it. So it wasn't too much of a problem for me to re-knit it because it's still bringing me huge amounts of joy and pleasure. And um, now that I have finished my Colourfield shawl, I imagine that for at least the next couple of days um, I am going to be solely knitting on this. So I, I don't imagine that it will be too long until it's completed. Perhaps at the weekend I may cast on another project or pick up one of my other languishing whips um, and give that some love, but I do think that it's going to be um, a fairly monogamous couple of days um, giving this some love and some affection and I love it. Oh, I love it. This yarn, wool kitchen yarn guys, it's dreamy. I love it so much, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> Moving on from what I have been knitting this week, let's talk a little bit about sewing. So it's time for So What, my sewing segment. And I'm really happy that So What is becoming much more of a regular occurrence on the podcast. I have been getting serious twitchy fingers when it comes to my sewing machine. I do want to spend a lot of time there. And I'm pretty sure that for the majority of Saturday this week, Fingers crossed, I'm gonna get some serious sewing time um, done, which is very, very exciting. But for now, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. Um, to start off with, um, what's in the works at the moment, I have started working on an ebony dress, um, or technically an ebony tunic, because you may or may not remember some fabric that I bought from the Handmade Fair this year. And that fabric was covered in little acorns, it was beautiful. I thought I had enough yardage for the ebony dress. It turns out I'm a little bit short on yardage for the dress. So I've decided to make the tunic, which has um, a kind of up and down hem. So the back is lower than the front. Um, it has a little raglan sleeve detail and I'm really excited to work on it. That's definitely going to be um, getting popped onto the sewing desk, shall we say, at the weekend. So maybe by next week I will have that to share with you. But um, I have a lot of other things that are in the works. I've been doing a lot of fabric washing, a lot of sorting out. Um, I have a list of things that need to be mended, that need to be altered, things that just need to be finished. But not a huge amount of other stuff has been going on. Luckily, in terms of content for this segment, you guys just help me out so much by leaving me amazing comments and um, sending me messages. And I was going through some comments that I've had on recent episodes of the podcast because I do enjoy reading every single one of the comments that you guys leave. Thank you so much for interacting with me. It makes this whole process so much more fun. Um, and I actually spotted a comment from Margaret McNeil Smith. So hi Margaret and thank you so much for your comment on one of my recent episodes. And something that you were interested in Margaret was the fact that I have made multiple versions of this pattern. This is the Blue A dress by Deer and Doe. And if I can just bring up your comment here, 
you asked um, what are the chances that you could show the four versions together like side by side on hangers just so we can see how they differ what fabric you used etc um, and I think Margaret that that is a brilliant idea and thank you so much for suggesting it so without further ado I'm going to give you guys a little rundown of one of my favourite patterns in the world which is the robe blue or the blue dress by Deer and Doe. Now my relationship with the blue dress pattern going down, back for a little time now because the first version of this dress I actually made in September of last year. Now I had found this pattern at a trip to Ray Stitch I believe when it was still at its smaller location. It's now moved to a much bigger store and it's beautiful and I would very much recommend that you pay a visit if you are ever in London particularly if you are near Loop. If you're visiting Loop Ray Stitch is literally a hop skip and a jump down the road so definitely pay them a visit because they are marvellous and that is where I found what it turned out to be pretty much one of the last ever copies of the Blue A dress in existence because pretty soon after that um, I bought the pattern it went out of print and was unavailable anywhere. It's now back in print, they've done a reimagining of it, um, of which I have made one version, so I will show you that in a little bit. But let's start off with um, my first ever version of the robe Blue A dress, which is this one! <laughs> this dress has definitely had a lot of love over the past year. It's one of my favourite projects that I have ever made. Um, and I must admit it's starting to show it a little bit. I can't wear it as much as I would like to just because, um, you know, it's a cotton dress and cotton doesn't do too well after extensive washing and that type of thing. But I still love it just as much as I did when I first made it. Um, it is the original version of the robe blue dress in its entirety insofar as it is the full dress version it also has the bow detail at the back which you kind of can see here there's the little bow um the bow detail is, this is the only dress that I've made with the bow. Um, I thought it was really cute for this version but um, I kind of steered away from it with other versions that I've made not entirely sure why <laughs> and I also did um, a contrasting collar so just the collar itself is in a lovely white cotton um, which you can see there the collar stand itself is still the same fabric as the dress and I did little white contrast cuffs because that type of thing that type of detail makes me incredibly happy. For this particular version I did change the collar. So the collar on the blue A dress is a pointed collar. Um, I love a Peter Pan collar so I always knew that I would be adjusting that to have a little rounded finish which is beautiful. I've also um, used some really really gorgeous vintage glass buttons on this dress. They're very subtle and they don't really show up against the fabric that I used for the dress but I love them and when I put this dress on and I'm doing it up and I feel the buttons it really does make me really happy because it's just a lovely touch. I'm a sucker for details as you will know if you've been watching for a little while. The fabric in itself was a purchase from one of my favourite online fabric shops. It's beautifully curated and filled with very very special things and that's M is for make and it's this fox in foxgloves fabric which is navy with little orange foxes and kind of ready pink um, foxgloves all over it and this is because of that fabric um, known as my foxy lady dress amongst my, my close friends. <laughs> I'm joking it's just what I've called it on the podcast previously but you are my close personal friends so so yeah but I made this for my 29th birthday and I actually wore it with this cardigan the Sophie cardigan and it was a really lovely outfit it made me feel really pretty and I just I just adore it it's one of my favorite dresses like I said that I've ever made and to be honest I think that sewing this up was the first step of me being 100% comfortable with sewing things for a different body type 
because it, again, if you've been watching the podcast for a while, you will know that since leaving the acting career that I had for many, many years, I have seen a slow increase in my weight, particularly since um, after I got married. You know, you get married, you get comfy. You um, you suddenly don't have to worry about fitting in a wedding dress and you can eat all the cake and pizza that you want. Um, but this dress really proved to me that I could still make things that made me feel beautiful, um, even though I was a different size um, from one that I had previously made a lot of pretty dresses for so it will always have a very special place in my heart for that. Now pretty soon after finishing my first version of the Blue A dress I decided it was about time that I make another version. In particular I wanted a version for when we went to Florida which was over Halloween. So this is pretty much a month after completing this dress I picked up some pretty awesome fabric from the Knitting and Stitching show in London when it was at Alexandra Palace and I sewed myself up my Halloween version of this dress. Now in terms of construction it is very very similar to the first version that I made. Again I have the contrasting fabric that I used for the collar and the cuffs. Um, I chose black for a slightly more kind of Halloween-y version and um, I used black buttons which were just purchased from John Lewis, just plain plastic black buttons. Um, the This dress took me next to no time to cut out and sew up and I really do think that that was because I'd had such a positive experience with the first version and this was so soon afterwards that it was just like snap done. I remember exactly what I needed to do, I remember all of the steps and it's ended up being a really really lovely version of this dress. It's a shame because it's so Halloween-y, I mean this, this print is kind of ridiculous in terms of it's got witches and vampires, a little eagle character, bats, cats, owls, everything you can think of is on here. I don't always wear this on a regular basis because it is so themed, although I do sometimes um, put kind of a longer jumper over the top to tone it down a little bit and then I'll wear it more. Um, for example, I did wear this when we were at Vogue Knitting Live when I was in New York um, because I like to keep Halloween alive for the entire year, but it doesn't get as much kind of action outside of the wardrobe as some other versions of the dress. Um, but now it's October, I can wear this all the time, so I need to get this out. I think I might wear this tomorrow actually, just because holding it is making me reminisce. And I did wear this to Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween party in Florida. So again, lots of good memories are sewn into this dress and I love it. It's such, I think this version proved to me how much I liked the pattern because not only is it flattering and does it make me feel um, great when I wear it, but it also sewed up very, very quickly because now I have experience of the pattern and I know exactly the size that I need to sew up in order for it to fit me. Um, there's very little that can go wrong with it, which is great. And I love it. Now for my next couple of versions of this dress, I can't actually remember which one came next. So I'm going to start with the one that I am wearing today, and that is the blouse version of the Robe Blue A dress. Just trying to get out of my cardigan because it was a little bit tangled around the button, which is fine. Talk amongst yourselves, wriggling out of my cardigan. <laughs> so yes, I'm going to start with this version. Da, 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 da. Now, this was made with fabric that I ended up purchasing in New York in January. So a little bit of time went by between version number two and this one. Um, I do think this one came next because I can remember that I sewed up the next version for Edinburgh Yarn Festival, which obviously came after Vogue Knitting Live. Goodness, it's, it's like looking at my previous calendar of things that I did last year. <laughs> this year just gone. I was a busy bee and I went to a lot of fun places. How lucky was I? But yes, this version, let me stand up just so that you can kind of see. It finishes around about here. It's tucked in at the moment, obviously, but it is a blouse version. And as you can see, this is the first version of this dress that I didn't use a contrasting fabric for the collar and cuffs. I did it all in this incredibly ridiculous <laughs> print um, by Cotton and Steel, which has all these beautiful little ponies on it. It also has some birds on it. Um, but I did use these really fun vintage buttons in this kind of corally pink 
pink, which matches the coral that is in a lot of the pattern of the fabric. And I really, really love this. I can pair it with, um, with skirts that I can tuck in. I also love wearing it with dungarees. Um, and it gets a lot of wear. I do really enjoy separates and very much in the same way, I'm just going to sit back down because otherwise I'm just giving you a shot of the boobs, which is fine, but not for the whole podcast. <laughs> um, very much like the first version of this dress reaffirmed to me my love of sewing in general. Making this reminded me that sewing separates was something that was really fun, that adds more variety into your wardrobe because you feel like you can mix and match more. Um, so yeah, it was very, very positive. And again, I um, made a little Peter Pan collar because I just love a Peter Pan collar, you guys. Can't get enough of it. Version number four. I hope you're sticking with me and that this isn't too tedious. Um, but version number four of this dress was a special one that I made, like I said, for Edinburgh Yarn Festival. It was pretty much a last minute kind of thing. Um, I wasn't planning on getting a huge amount of stuff done before Edinburgh Yarn Festival, but I ended up having a completely me made outfit for each of the days that I was going to be there, which was great. <laughs> um, but I had to make another version of the Blue A dress because it's, it's my favorite and there was some fabric in my stash that had been calling my name for the longest time. I had picked it up in the January sale at John Lewis and it was a kitty cat fabric. You can just see it there. But the real thing that just makes my heart happy about this outfit is the fact that I embroidered cats onto the collar. <laughs> So there they are, my little kitty cat friends, aren't they adorable? I did a kind of bit of freehand embroidery on the collar. I picked out two different cat faces from the cats that are on this fabric and I just embroidered those onto the collar of this dress. I love this dress. It's quite simple in its construction. Um, I did make a couple of changes to the dress that I hadn't done previously. One of those changes was um, omitting the bow. There's no bow in this one in the same way that there's no bow in the Halloween version. Um, but I also changed the sleeves a little bit. Every other version of this dress that I've made, including the blouse, has these little puffed sleeves. So it has the sleeve puff with a gathered in cuff, um, which is very, very cute. But for this fabric, because it's a little bit heavier weight, um, it's a heavyweight cotton fabric. I thought that this would look a bit too much and a bit bulky. So I changed it into a straight sleeve. I literally just kind of left it nice and open. I took a little bit of the ease out of the, the pattern and kind of fiddled around with it. It still has a little bit of gathering around the top. So there's a slight puff there, but in terms of the finish, it's a lot more relaxed, um, which I think works for this fabric. I really, really like it. Um, I finished it off with some little kind of pearl buttons, just white pearl buttons. I think I purchased these at John Lewis as well. And I really, really love it. It feels like a Wednesday Adams kind of outfit. I think that she would have had a love for this dress. Um, also in terms of the collar contrast, I also did the collar stand in the white fabric. Um, so that is... Um, is different as well. I think it adds um, a little bit of intrigue, a little bit of difference uh, between the other versions that I've done. Um, and this one's great. I know that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily want to wear a cat dress on a regular basis, but this is something that I reach for all the time. It makes me happy to wear. And um, gosh, just looking at this, I remember thinking at the time that I needed to make a version with pugs on it, and I still feel that way. So I'm still searching out the perfect pug fabric to make myself a pug version of this dress so that I can make Rolly the Pug proud. <laughs> We're nearly there, guys. I have one more version of this dress to share with you, and I'm going to keep it brief because I actually shared this one with you relatively recently, and that is this one. Ba -ba -ba -ba. This is actually the re- imagining of the blue a dress this is the reprint um, of the pattern and it was kindly sent to me by the lovely lovely people at deer and doe before this was up for general consumption so i got to have a go at this pattern basically before anyone else did which was a lovely lovely experience and i very much enjoyed it um it's obviously made up of this beautiful red tartan fabric it's a cotton poplin that i purchased from another one of my favorite online fabric stores which was fabric godmother 
um, and I did a lot of pattern matching for the tartans, for a lot of checks nicely lined up, which makes me very, very happy. Um, I also did a contrast collar. I mean, you, you can see the type of thing that I enjoy. I wanted a little white Peter Pan collar on this one because I just think it looks really nice next to the tartan. And I used these kind of, I suppose they're kind of a creamy fawn coloured buttons. And I know that these did come from John Lewis. Suffice it to say, a lot of my buttons come from John Lewis, in case you hadn't noticed. But yes, the main difference with this dress from the versions that I've done previously is because this is the reworking of that pattern, the sleeves are very different. Um, there are little cap sleeves on this, as you can see, teeny little cap sleeves, not puffed sleeves like this. And I do really like how the cap sleeves look. I think that they're very, very sweet, but personally, I'm all about the puff sleeve. And the thing that I proved with my cap version of the dress, oh, just reaching down, is that you can alter that sleeve into a regular sleeve without many problems at all. So in terms of my construction of this pattern in the future, because you can pretty much guarantee I will be making more versions of it, um, I will probably stick with the original version just because it works more for my personal style. The other main difference with this one is that it's slightly longer and that the sleeve holes come up a little bit higher. So you can do this one sleeveless and it's more flattering. So if you do want to make this dress as a sleeveless version, I'd recommend um, the, the new version because it's gonna be slightly more flattering around the old armholes for you. But yes, those are all of the versions of the Blue A dress that I have sewn up. And um, I do imagine that I will make more in the future. This is pretty much my go-to outfit. It feels like a uniform for me. And it makes things very simple because I know that when I put on one of these dresses, I'm automatically going to feel pretty and stylish and yet relaxed because the fit of them is not kind of super tight or uncomfortable. And I just love them. I think they work well my own personal style and they make me happy. So yeah, a big thumbs up to the robe blue a dress um, or the blue a dress. I always call it the robe blue a dress but I realise that robe is dress in French so I'm basically saying the dress blue dress, dress blue a dress, which is ridiculous. But yes, the blue a dress. Margaret, I hope that that whetted your appetite about this pattern um, and I hope that it was interesting for all of you to see the progression that that pattern has had in my life, near and dear to my heart as it is. Okay, my lovelies, it is time for our last segment of the podcast, which is, of course, General Waffle. General Waffle. And the General Waffle segment, for those of you who don't know, is my little kind of self-indulgent segment at the end of the podcast where I can waffle on about anything and everything that takes my fancy. And considering that the So What segment was all to do with someone leaving a lovely comment and me finding what they had to say very very interesting um it won't surprise you that the so that the general waffle segment is going to take a very similar vein this week again i was going through some comments and i saw a really really lovely one from michelle d and Michelle commented, um, Katie, you must really love your new job. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I have, um, not really recently now, it feels like it's been a little while in the new job. I am now working for Tilly and the Buttons. Um, I am based at their London office. And yes, it's been, it's been a great change. So, hurrah. Um, but going back to your comments, I don't know what your previous job was, but I know that your career trajectory is following your passions in an inspiring way. Any tips for a job seeker? And I think that's a great comment. So thank you so much, Michelle, for taking the time to write that to me. And I just wanted to talk about this a little bit because I found it really interesting. And I have talked previously about jobs that I have done um, on the channel. Um, but to give you a kind of brief history, very brief, I don't want to go into it too much to kind of bore everyone who's already heard this story, but um, my original career of choice was as a performer in musical theatre. That's what I basically spent the entire of my childhood and adolescence working towards. I also went to drama school. Um, I have a degree in musical theatre and after graduating from drama school, I was lucky enough to sign with a really fabulous agent and I worked for many years as a performer um, doing jobs um, in the UK, over, overseas, um, on tours, working in the West End. I've been incredibly fortunate to do some wonderful jobs and it was truly an amazing part of my life. 
Um, if you want to kind of hear more about that side of my life um, and why I kind of stopped being an actor, I have actually made a video. Um, one of my 30 before 30 videos was about um, not being an actor anymore, so I will link that in the description down below in case you haven't seen it and you're interested. But when I decided that I wasn't going to be an actor anymore, um, I, I was kind of a bit lost for a while in terms of jobs. Um, I'd always done intermittent jobs between acting jobs because the thing about anything creative creative is a lot of the time you will have to do random jobs in between the jobs that you really want to do. So I'd done a lot of retail, um, in particular I'd worked at a sweet shop which had been wonderful, um, but my first full-time job after finishing as an actor was working in a vintage clothes shop, a reproduction vintage clothes shop, which I did for, um, for a little while, a few years. And then after that I moved into a very, very different line of work, which was IT, <laughs> which was basically um, troubleshooting phones and computers and doing repairs. And I did that for two and a half years before applying for my job at Tilly's and being fortunate enough to get that job. So my career really has gone all over the place. It's It's been a bit of a meandering um, kind of journey. So when you talk about a trajectory, <laughs> Michelle, it does make me laugh because it feels, you know, a tra trajectory kind of feels like this and my journey has been very much like this. It took me a while to work out where I wanted to be, who I wanted to be. Um, in particular, when I stopped being an actor, that had been such a huge defining part of who I was for such a long time. I floundered for a very, very long time afterwards. Um, and it's taken me many years to get to this point where I feel that I'm finally working in a field where I am knowledgeable, where I enjoy the work and where I have a lot to offer. Because when you've given so much of yourself to one very specific field um, that doesn't really really have a huge amount of transferable um, skills, or at least it doesn't appear to on paper, it can be quite frustrating. But in terms of um, advice for a fellow job seeker, um, I would by no means say that I am the be all and end all about these things. Whenever I get questions about the big things in life, which I do think jobs are, because we spend such a lot of our time doing them, don't we? I mean, we probably spend more time at our jobs than we do in all of the other aspects of our lives. So it's it's important to kind of get it right. Um, and I still feel that I'm on a journey, to be honest, when it comes to my job. And I don't feel that my job is the defining element of myself. But one thing that I would say is following your passions, as you said, is something that is incredibly important to do. And if you can do that, then fabulous. But equally, I come from a slightly odd place where I did pursue my passion, my number one passion for the longest time. and. I realised that the dream wasn't quite what I thought it would be in reality. And that's very much what acting was for me, which is why it took me such a long time to pick myself up after that and steer myself in the right direction in terms of working towards a place where I wanted to be with my career. I have a couple of little pieces of advice that I would give to you if you're in a position where you are kind of seeking a change of job or something new. Um, and they're not really specifically about how to get the job that you want and all of that type of thing, because I don't think that I'm in the right position to be able to advise you on that. But I do have a couple of little things that I have learnt through my experiences of moving through different professions, vastly different fields, working with lots of different people that I think are now benefiting me because of what I've learned from all of that. So firstly, I would say whatever job that you are in, wherever you're working, whatever you're doing, there has to be some aspect of it that brings you joy and brings you satisfaction. Um, I have learned from experience that even when you're doing the thing that you think is the dream job, if it's not bringing you joy, there is really no point in pursuing it at all. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be working in the dream job, uh, because that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. But whatever it is that you're seeking out, it has to be the thing that is at least in some way making you happy. If you're being underappreciated by people, if 
people are not looking at you and seeing you for the incredible human being that you are with the amount that you have to offer that you do, then something is very, very wrong. Um, and you really need to either change the situation that you're in, in order to make that better for you so that you are appreciated. So people see you for who you are and they're just like, yep, yeah, you're amazing. And I acknowledge that or you have to maybe make a change. I think that was one of the biggest problems that I've had in my professional life is it's very easy to get kind of comfortable doing the thing that you've been doing for some time. And it's a lot scarier to try and break into something new. But when you're doing that same thing day after day, all those hours, all that time, and you're not getting the recognition that you want and the appreciation that you should get, and it's not making you happy in at least a little part of your soul. It doesn't have to be everything, but it has to be something. And if it's not, then you really need to try and address that. And like I said, I know that's hard, but for me, that's been an incredibly healing process, acknowledging my own sense of self-worth and expecting and, and wanting other people to at least partly be able to acknowledge that as well. Which brings me on to my second point. Uh, be kind to yourself um, when it comes to your job. I think when we pick the type of job that we want to do, it's very easy to kind of put a lot of pressure on things to do with our lives. You know, we have to have a certain amount of money. We have bills to pay. We have mortgages to pay. We have children to look after. We have dependents. We have pets. We have um, the new bathroom that needs to be paid for and we need to get tiles. And you, you put all this pressure on yourself. So when you're thinking about maybe changing job or making a leap that might mean a slight difference in your financial state status, again, that can be incredibly hard. But one of the best pieces of advice that Emrys actually gave to me um, when when I was going through some particular stressful points of, of my working career and feeling very depressed and very um, kind of painted into a corner in terms of not being able to be in any position to change the situation that I was in, it doesn't matter how much money you're making if you're kind of banging your head against the wall the money is one thing, it's a wonderful thing to have and it always frustrates me when people kind of say, oh it's not about the money, it's about doing the thing that you love, because I think that's a lovely mentality to have but it's also sadly a little bit naive because money in the current climate is 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 the way the world goes around and I'm not talking about the money that we have to spend on all the yarn and all the fabric and all the fabulous things, the money to pay your bills <laughs> and um, to, to kind of you know get by from a day-to-day -day basis and pay for food and pay for all of that stuff is important but equally if you place all of your um happiness on the money that you're getting and the paycheck you're getting again that can be where things are problematic and sometimes you just have to be kind to you regardless of of what's going on in terms of your paycheck and this isn't me telling you jump ship and not think about anything in terms of money but try and think about your own mental health, your own sense of well-being and your own happiness as being as much of a high value as the money that you're getting from the job. That again really helped me um, in terms of reassessing what was most important and what was the right thing to do at any one particular time. My last little bit of advice um, is really kind of regarding my career in acting again, um, which is it's okay if the dream job isn't the dream job because I've learned from experience that you can put your entire self into something for a very long time and feel almost worthless when it's done because that happened to me <laughs> and the thing that I learned from that was to really take my happiness where I find it. I wouldn't have imagined in a million years that after stopping work as an actor that I would be fixing computers for a living, which I did for a period of time, or that I would be working for this wonderful business, um, manufacturing sewing patterns in a field that I have so much love and so much passion for. And I must admit, I was lucky to get this job because an opening just happened to be there and I applied on a whim and then I got an interview and then everything happened very quickly after that. And I think that the important thing is it's okay 
if you fall down and it's okay if things go badly it's okay if like i said the dream isn't the dream and you're not happy from that the most important thing is to acknowledge the fact that you're in a bad place that things are difficult but to try to remain as open as you can to the possibility of other things happening and i know that sounds really a bit wishy-washy and a bit like mm be open to the universe and stuff. But truth, cards out on the table. When I was in my previous job, I had been applying for other jobs for quite some time and I had either not been getting any replies from the jobs that I had been applying for and I then went to interview for a job that I thought would be the one, would be the thing that saved me and nothing came of it and it was a stressful time a stressful interview and it was very disheartening and it would have been possible at that point for me to have just accepted the reality that was my working life and just stay where I was and stay feeling angry and depressed and all of these ridiculous emotions that were kind of just just ugly and horrible and turning me into someone who was ugly and horrible the more I was exposed to them because I did not like the type of person that I was when I was at my previous job um, because it wasn't helping me and my mental health anything. I could have very easily just kind of given up after all of those negative experiences and not applied for the job at Tilly's which I just saw um, an application thing pop up on Instagram of all places and I applied on a whim and I could have just thought there's no point because I'm not going to be good enough or the pay is not going to be enough or this isn't going to be enough and it's going to be it's just not going to work because nothing else has worked um, and it just so happened that on a whim out of the blue without telling anybody I just applied for it and here we are and that could very very easily not have happened which is why I think it's very important to stay as open as you can. Look after yourself, obviously, and I know how hard it can be. I, I know, I really, really know from experience how difficult it can be to find kind of where you think you fit in your working life and how much that impacts everything, I know. But I think if you can remain open to the possibility of something better, then that's a really good place to start, so yeah. <laughs> I hope that's been vaguely helpful for you. Um, I appreciate it was a bit waffly and off tangent. But genuinely, I think that we're sold this idea that there's a clear and easy path when it comes to what our career will be and what our working life will be. We do a certain amount of exams and then we do a degree in this and then we'll just get a job in it and then we'll stay in it for the rest of our lives and it will be fantastic. I know very, very, very few people that that has happened for. And it is very scary when you're not presented with that idea when you're younger and then it happens to you as an adult it's it's overwhelming but i think out of that you can really truly find who you are and what works for you and that's more important than anything else find what works for you whatever that might be so that is it from this week's episode of Inside Number 23, you guys. Thank you so much for bearing with me. I appreciate this episode's been a little bit all over the place and has been very chat heavy. Um, so hopefully next week's episode will have a lot more crafty content for you. If you have enjoyed the video, please do give me a thumbs up and pop a comment down below if you would like. Also hit subscribe if you haven't done already because that will keep you up to date as to when there are new videos on the channel. Um, I just love you all so much. Thank you for being part of my strange and extraordinary online crafting family. I appreciate and love each and every one of you um, and you make this worthwhile. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I hope you all have an incredible week until I see you next, filled with sewing and knitting and all of those good things. I think tonight I'm going to be weaving in my ends of my Colourfield shawl whilst watching quite a few episodes of Riverdale, which I started today and I know I'm behind the times because because everybody else appears to have watched it already but I quite like it it's cute <laughs> anyway from me to you I'm sending you all the good things have an awesome week and I will see you all really really soon bye